Um, so Dave, first of all, I would like to have a chat with you about the purpose. No, we've heard already the word purpose this morning. And um, at Campbell's, you've been doing a great work about that. Um, why a company like Campbell's with 150 years of experience uh, really um, think that developing a purpose is worth? The, um, it's, it's ironic that you have, I'm not sure what slides we have, but um, it's ironic that we have two companies that have been around for almost 150 years. Campbell's 146 years old. And both of these companies got in the business um, for a reason. There's a reason these companies started. And over time, um, they, they don't lose their way. It's just that reason um, kind of dissolves. And Campbell has been around, like I said, and is doing good things. I've been there almost seven years now. And we were struggling with, as a new CEO came in, what do we really stand for? Mm -hmm. And um, it, it's ironic because Sally's change management model and Paul's storytelling mm -hmm. is really what this is about. It's, it's how you bring uh, that value back into the day-to-day -day business. And there were t we had proposed a purpose three years ago or working through one, and the company wasn't ready yet. We just weren't ready yet. And we did launch, um, it, it took 18 months after we dove in, and all of this work and all of this alignment inside the company uh, boil down to seven words that when you hear them, you will say, eh, that's nice. That sounds like any other food company. But what it's done is it's given us a whole framework. It's kind of taken us back to the beginning. What, why are we in business? Um, Campbell's Purpose, we launched, um, I actually think it was probably launched publicly mm -hmm. at Sustainable Brands last year with our CEO and uh, president of Plum Organics, uh, Neil, uh, Denise Morrison and, and um, Neil Grimmer. It's real food that matters for life's moments. And um, again, I don't know if we, no, nope. oh, I see. I can't actually see what is being presented. So we talked a little bit about some of this drive. This is us kind of working into the, um, and I mean, we brought everybody involved, uh, everybody at the C-suite, all the work and all the pain. And what it's doing is giving us a whole new if we break this down, I'll talk about it in a little while, how you break it down and how it's changing behavior. But it's a, it's a very simple thing that's driven a lot of work inside the company and um, really driving some benefit. How would you define, in your own words, purpose? Yeah, so the Campbell is a company of um, many brands. Um, Pepperidge Farm, Pace, Prego, Swanson, Arnott's. Um, Plum Organics, Both House Farm, that all have brand identities. They all have a reason for being. They all have a, a conversation with consumers. Purpose is really what, if you get it right, it's what brings the employees to work every day, and it's the way a consumer would describe the company. Um, and it's not something that you're ever done with. Um, the goal would be those words on the slide, if I have a conversation with a, a Campbell consumer anywhere in the world, they're, they're in this space. They're describing real food or the way that food can matter in my life or in society, the role the company's played. And um, our brand people would love them to talk about the moment uh, with that food. <laughs> but what makes it so different from the traditional positioning? It, it's a, it is a higher order. It's a, um, mm -hmm. I think that, you know, brands communicate interactive. It's, 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 what brands do is the right thing. And some companies are a single brand and they can talk in, in minds of purpose. But what the, what the purpose does, let me see if I think I have it. It, it. it sets a set of values and expectations. And they range from what what is stands for real food, and, and what is food that matters. And the brands can ladder up into it. And I really think the purpose brings us back to how we started. It also, um, ironically, gives me a, a whole framework to drive change inside the company, using both you know, Sally's framework of change, or others, uh, my, my own personal one, but it, it, mirror, it mirrors hers very well and the example that Paul shared about storytelling. Mm. Explain to us in detail, please, Paul, um, 
the meaning of your purpose so we can uh, all yeah. get it. So this, this slide that's up here now talks about um, what we mean by real food. And, and when, when I say the words, those two words to you, uh, real food, there's a whole set of things that come into your mind. It's about where the food's grown, how it's produced, who grew it, what's in it, how is it made, how does it come to me. Um, the, the that matters part, really food that matters. If you think about a food company and all of the activities that leading companies are doing all over the world, are we really being consistent? Are we really central in making sure that the food that we deal with matters? Are we working on things in our community, in the society, where we operate, mm -hmm. sustainable agriculture, all the way through, you know, dealing with issues around food waste um, and all the resources that go into it. It's the whole package. And it, it's a filter. You know, we get asked to do a thousand things, to support a thousand causes, um, to work in a thousand places. But are we really focused on food that matters? And it drives our behavior. And then the last part, it, the brands love it. The, the, the brand managers, um, R&D loves it. We talk about bringing the chef closer to the production and the chef. We've got you know, a whole team of culinary experts closer to the consumer. And what moment are we actually trying to impact? For a decade, all food companies were about nourishing. Sounds good. Um, it's kind of all-encompassing. But food is really about the moment that you share it, either as an individual, um, with your family, um, out in public, um, mm -hmm. an indulgent moment, a healthy moment. And it, it's, those seven words have given everybody in the company something to hang their, their own personal purpose on and to move the agenda. Mm. But Dave, in a tangible way, which do you think would be the opportunities that um, a company has when they have a purpose and when they really believe and activate their purpose? I would say that there's, again, every company is different and they're on tra different trajectories. And Campbell is one place and, and you know, are, there are great companies and not so great companies. But I think what a purpose does is reset your clock. And uh, we've talked a little bit about it. It's all through, the, it's, the, it's the role of that enterprise in society. It's the role that they had when they first started out. Um, they were all, I believe, personally believe, that every business starts, even, even the example of the small design agency, mm -hmm. right? You, you started with a purpose. And um, a lot of things can take us off the course. Uh, quarterly earnings uh, announcements in the US can take you off the course. Um, a change in leadership at the company can take you off the course. Um, competition in the marketplace. But a purpose can help you get back on track, number one, about why you're doing what you're doing. It's helped us think about the companies that we might be thinking about mergers and acquisitions. It's helped us think about the way we're gonna formulate or reformulate our products. Um, and it's really helping, it's pushing us in this mode of transparency or radical transparency with consumers. Um, today's consumer in the food business really does want to know much more about where the food comes from, how it's raised and who raised it. And the first two words of the purpose challenge us. If we're not comfortable with what real is, how do we expect a consumer to be? Definitely. Mm, okay, but I'm a marketing person now. I'm in the organization and now I'm telling you, Dave, um, but this purpose thing, that is going to drive me sales? I'm go am I going to sell more or, or not really? Because, you know. Yeah, it's fun. you keep asking me tough questions like I'm not answering your question the first time. You are, but yeah. I'm just pushing the, um, you a bit more. Um, I actually think our marketing people are celebrating. The, you know, Campbell is a company of 20,000 employees, and they range. There's people that have been there 50 years, and people we hired yesterday, or starting today, Monday. Um, but the people inside Campbell always wanted permission to tackle something like the purpose. And uh, oftentimes, they, you know, they're, they feel constrained. They're in finance or they're in marketing and they've got a brand architecture and this is what my brand says. <laughs> but the purpose tells everybody that they can break those rules and help us drive the purpose. Um, you know, we're an $8 billion company. We have visions of being a, a $10 billion company. We're not the biggest company in the world. 
Um, we think by following our purpose, we can be the biggest small company in the world and that we have some of the opportunities that some of our competitors may not have. Um, and it's really, there's, you know, there's a lot of really fun things that I'm working on with the brand managers and R&D um, that will be public at some point, you know, I hope. But they're really, it's giving everybody permission to take on a new challenge. Mm. If I think about um, the steps and the process that you made at Campbell's, and also uh, I'm just uh, looking at you because I know that you have a long experience in developing sustainability in many multinational companies and uh, big companies. Mm, which would be your advice for a company that want to develop, to create a purpose, and then to activate that purpose? Yeah, I'm going to go back so that you're not looking at the same slide there. You kind of go back to the... If you try to, all of us in the room, um, whether we feel like it or not, are change agents. And oftentimes we're trying to move um, major corporations, at least the ones of us that work in companies, um, by ourselves, right? We're, we're not CEOs, we're not, um, we're not the CFO for the most part. We're, we're trying to take the tools that are in place, uh, move the levers, build the case for change, right? Set the long-term destination targets that drive change in behavior. The, what, what I found helpful is, in the course of my career, I've worked for two large publicly traded companies um, in different sectors, technology and now food. And um, it, it's taken, in both cases, it's very um, ironic, you know, five, six, sometimes maybe seven years to build the case to find, the, I mean, and it's one person at a time. Mm -hmm. um, set the long-term goals, put all kinds of stretch and tension in the system, build the organizational structure matrix that, that lets you drive it, and then to kind of seed change, almost like a virus, throughout the organization. And this is the turning point at Campbell. I really do. Um, you know, we've been driving things in, in our global footprint and energy, water, and waste and sustainable agriculture, some really in innovative programs and social impact. We have been trying to create the proof points that we could live this way, make money, um, tell a better story to our consumers, and really set tone for the long term. And I think it's taken time, um, but little by little, uh, everybody starts to see the way they can leverage this as value and not extra work. Very nice. Um, how can we have really meaningful conversations with the heads of all those departments that you were mentioning? Could we maybe just go one by one and, and you just give us some flash sure, ideas sure. about your experience? And Okay, let's take human resources. What do I tell to... I'm a sustainability leader. What do I tell to a head of human resources? Which are the levers? What do I have to tell this guy to convince him? The, f the first thing you have to do is you don't tell him anything. You ask him um, what, what he needs, what he's trying to drive to be the most successful. Sometimes you just ask him how is he measured or how is she measured in terms of performance. Um, and from HR, it might be staffing, recruiting, retention, um, employee engagement, you know, pride in the workplace, maybe an org health survey, um, maybe an exit survey when people leave, right? Can they recruit from the best of the best? Can they get to the best schools? Everything we're talking about here, right, can answer every single one of those. I don't have a lot of discussions about um, here I'm from sustainability and here's how you can do your job better. I think we used to do that a decade ago um, and that's why it took us longer. Now it's much more about how can I help in, in HR, how can I help build a better employee base? How can I help you recruit the best? Right? How can I help them feel engaged and productive and purposeful at work? Um, how can I help them all be purpose ambassadors when they're out speaking? Um, and how can they really bring their whole selves to work? Because work is almost like a 24-hour-a-day job. Mm. And so that's, that's HR. Mm, very interesting. Uh, let's say... The finance guys now. Finance is always the tough one, but um, <laughs> it's, it's about the toughest I one. Knew it. <laughs> but it's not impossible. It's, the, uh, it's a similar conversation. You know, it's, finance is a little bit more black and white in terms of cost savings, uh, top line um, costs, and then bottom line numbers. Uh, but as a sustainability professional, you have to have that business acumen. You really have to understand the business in order to help them drive it. There's a, almost everything we touch 
on the environmental sustainability side is a finance topic, right? So we're driving all kinds of change, moving, kind of enab enabling the construction of renewable systems at our, at our facilities from uh, one of the biggest uh, inside the fence solar facilities in Ohio to a biogas digester, which takes our own waste and generates more energy. We've saved 60, um, more than $60 million just the last five years in cost savings, just subtracting costs from the bottom line. That doesn't go to the storytelling we can do. The other thing that's happened, and, and this room would understand it probably more than others, is the investor story, right? So I, I engage a lot with investor analysts, even mainstream analysts now more and more, not just sustainability, but the big sustainability, I don't use the word sustainability, but health and wellness, um, resiliency in the supply chain. These are all things that you can really help. The CFO, if he can't tell the story about why we do what we do, we are not there yet. Mm. What about the, the metrics for the finance guys? Because the metrics are quite a challenge for all of us. Uh, any just uh, advice or uh, recommendation on that, just for well, us I, to... There's, there's two yeah. sides to this, I think, on the finance side. One is um, direct savings, and that's a pretty easy, that's probably the easiest thing for us to get and track mm -hmm. and measure. We don't get it all, though. The, the internal business systems, mm. part of what we have to do is be almost you know, IT business systems people because companies aren't set up to track either the savings we produce mm -hmm. or the benefits that we can create this way. Mm -hmm. And that's where I think finance has a huge opportunity to come to the table and help us set metrics for the benefits. You know, what does it mean? What's it worth to have uh, recruit from the best of the best attract you know, and retain the best talent. These are things we want to do but are very hard measuring. Or social, what, what's, the, what's the benefit of effective policy or license to operate in your community? Mm -hmm. The finance people can help us set those metrics. Mm -hmm. And um, inviting some of them to the table has been, has been helpful. Mm -hmm. But it's still, I would say that the metrics are, they're much more we as a, as a, as a whole kind of financial industry are focused on cost savings and have a very hard time measuring the revenue increases from this kind of work. Mm. Mm, R&D, innovation. What's that? Oh, innovation, R&D. Um, this is a good one. Um, this is also, and this depends on the sector you're in because different sectors put R&D and innovation in different places in the pipeline. Mm -hmm. In the food sector, R&D is all about bringing um, kind of all the great ideas that the culinary um, group that we have, the group of chefs, in their, in their kind of culinary kitchens to the kitchen table, right, to the final product. And it means bringing the chefs closer to where and how we produce the food, as well as to the farmer, but then bringing all those insights all the way through. And there are times where marketing will come up with an idea and R&D will try to serve that um, relationship. Now we're trying to create R&D, trying to lead inside the company as well. But around R&D, what I try to do and try to help them, is there steps in the R&D process. There's, a, there's packaging steps, there's sourcing steps, mm -hmm. there's formulation steps, there's cooking steps, and all of those are an opportunity for improvement in sustainability. Can, if I'm gonna change a package in any way, you know, can I make it lighter? Can I put more recycled content into it? Can I um, make it more recyclable at end of life? Um, you know, the bottles are so thin anymore, the caps are so tiny, these are all steps that were in the innovation cycle. Can I source the product differently? Can I work with my suppliers? There's a ton of opportunity. It, and you, don't need, you don't need a thousand metrics. If you focus on you know, packaging, a health and wellness move the needle, and a sustainability, energy, water, waste, you, you can count them on, on one hand. Um, that can revolutionize a company. If you forget them, you get to market before you realize you might have made a mistake. Marketing and sales. So marketing and sales, is, uh, it's been one of the toughest ones. These yeah. are really people that want to embrace it, especially the marketing side. The marketing folks um, love to, to tell stories. They love to close the gap between the, the food and the consumer. I don't think there's a challenge in the marketing space except that purpose, the purpose is enduring. The purpose isn't a seasonal campaign, right? You can't do a, a purpose idea and then like drop it, start over again next year. It has to be a drumbeat. It has to be for the long haul. Sales is a chicken and egg, a, a, course, a horse and cart story, where oftentimes we'll have retailers that this is not part of their agenda yet. 
and uh, we get in the mode of trying to convince them, which may not be that helpful. Um, and we also have other retailers that are just dying to have these stories. Where we can really help a retailer tell this story, it really does help sales, and it's long term again. It's, it's very simple. Um, a consumer that is in a retailer that is aligned with their purpose, more things show up in that cart, more dollars go out the door. Hmm. Um, talking about this marketing, guys, how do you <laughs> get them involved for developing a purpose? Because I, I guess that they are quite, or they feel quite. Um, I, yeah, the you know the marketing guys. That, no? The um, there's, marketing there's some marketing. Girl. There's some marketing, marketing ladies girl. in there too. The, the 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 interesting thing about the purpose is that because we're a house of brands, the the marketing people struggled at first. Um, Pepperidge Farm, uh, Arnott's, Bolt House Farm, Plum Organics were afraid to be in a rolled up purpose of Campbell. We really had to find one that would resonate and work with them so that we can ladder it. And it's growing. You, now, there was a bunch of skepticism at the beginning. But as it's come together, as it started to play out, we've seen brands jumping on board. This is how I can leverage the purpose. This is how I'm going to bring the purpose to life. Um, have whole new teams. We're even launching in June an employee affinity network. Uh, we've had a bunch of employee affinity networks. We're launching one in June that's focused on the purpose and sustainability in food mm -hmm. um, that our lead chef is going to run, uh, partnered with me. It's, it plays out across the board. Mm. Procurement? Procurement is, um, uh, I love procurement. It's where I spend a lot of my time. Um, we have they are your favorites, huh? I see. It's one of my favorites. They've have, they have embraced my uh, model of change, mm -hmm. and they're a role model I use inside the company. We've hired a, a lead uh, in, in sustainability for procurement. Um, my goal is not to build, uh, my team is very tiny. I was the first one, only one. My goal is mm -hmm. to build competency within the organization. And uh, procurement has put somebody in place in their organization to lead sustainability. They've created a sustainable procurement strategy, a long-term strategy, the first time for the company in 146 years. They are going category by category, identifying risks and opportunities, ways to build a more resilient supply chain. We're taking those categories and ranking them based on consumer interests, risks in the supply chain, what our customers are asking for. It's, it's great. It's one of the things um, that is real and we haven't gotten to the point of telling the story yet, but it's amazing to see the work coming. It, it, the other thing that makes um, it rewarding is I know it's going to stick. It's not me trying to convince a person to do a good thing. It's me trying to, it's me that is working with an organization that has said, we do own this. We're going to create the strategy. We're going to put the business and the operations in place. If, um, if I win the lottery tomorrow, procurement will still be working on that strategy. <laughs> uh which, were, uh, which was the key for that success with that specific department, you think? In procurement? Yeah. Um, for, for the, you know, like I said, I've been there six and a half, almost seven years now, and almost everything that is coming into the food business, um, that's a controversy over the past six or seven years, and the, the attention to where food is sourced and what the ingredients are comes into procurement. Uh, procurement in most food companies has one job, um, to source, you know, good, solid ingredients. Mm. But they do it, their whole goal is to do it at a lower cost, right? Total delivered cost. How can they reduce cost by satisfying the consumer and the business need? Everything I brought to them was more cost. Mm. Every single thing. Um, and that exists today, right? Uh, the, a, sustain, a more sustainable supply chain has shorter, has it increased short-term costs and decreased long-term costs. They saw it, they got it, but they were all measured on this delivering you know, less cost now versus less cost later on. Um, and it, it's taken that shift, and they've, they, instead of running around trying to solve crises, they want to position themselves for the long term. So they've started to push their time horizon out. And it's really been a win for us, it's been a win for procurement, uh, new relationships with our growers. It's, it's all good. But it was really the shift from short term to long term. Mm. What happens with uh, the situation where you face a, a person that really doesn't care about sustainability at all, as one of, uh, uh, as, as being a head of those departments, no? Um, yeah, that's not, I don't know that that's uh, unique in any company. And I think that, um, you know, part of it is what we talked about before. 
I'm not there to, to tell this person how to be more sustainable. Mm -hmm. And I'm not really, I, and I, I, my job is, I don't view my job is to convince them about climate change or water scarcity. Um, my job is to change the company so that is inherently addressing those issues from, and turning them from risk to opportunities and competitive advantages. So my job is, if, if this is a person that's a leader in our company that is driving organizational issues, I want to help him be better at whatever he or she is doing. And I think sustainability, corporate citizenship, community impact are all tools um, that I can help them do their job in a better way and not try to convince them. I just, it's mm -hmm. just something that I think we've moved away from um, mm -hmm. over time. Good. Um, sustainability means to think in the long term, mm -hmm. uh, Dave. But then the, the, the problem comes when you need to do this short-term decision making. Mm -hmm. Which do you think are the levers or, or the main points to really have sustainability on the table for decision making day to day? The purpose, right? You've gone, you've gone full circle. I think without it, without a compass, without what we stand for, without what we're trying to drive, you get shorter and shorter and shorter term decision making. And I also think you get worse decisions the shorter term you get. I think if you can, and that's what this is doing to, for us. Um, like I said, it's seven simple words that may not mean anything to you, but when we read them, it pushes us to think about not, you know, are we going to save money this mm -hmm. quarter, but are we living our lives inconsistent with the purpose? And it really comes about in the, the product and the causes we support. You, you can see it play out almost every day mm -hmm. in uh, you know, product formulations, product choices, ingredient choices, and the causes that we're asked to support. Wow, Dave, I need to <laughs> think about all this. <laughs> Um, any other thing you want to share? Purpose, integrating sustainability into the different departments? I think, I mean, the only thing I would say is it's, um, it's not easy to do, number one. You do need some fellow travelers. Um, you need some people that are like-minded that you can kind of come together. Creating a purpose for a you know, a multinational company, um, you know, a publicly traded company, it's not something you kind of do in, in your cube and shop it around. Um, it, there's a lot of effort and work inside that you overcome inertia and systems that have built up over time. And it, we're not there. I mean, the, the words are there, but the, we have a ton of work to do inside still in the company. But it's, it's in a much more um, optimistic way. There's, uh, instead of feeling like you're always under the gun, with creating some kind of uh, North Star, you don't have to call it a purpose, you can call it, you know, whatever, mm -hmm. I guess people used to call them missions, but as long as they're the right words, and then they're, they're the right orientation, they're not a, describe, a description about now, they're a description about the future, and they're not a description of how you would describe your company or product, but how the consumer would, I think you're in the right direction. If, the other, I mean, it's a pretty simple, question to ask, but if you ask what your consumer wants in this decision, you'll usually get to the right place as well. Mm -hmm. Dave, it's been great to have your thoughts. I, um, we're going to have you um, with Cohen this afternoon in a breakout session mm -hmm. to talk more about that. Um, uh, just to say thank you, I, I think I would do you uh, 200 questions, I just could do 10. Uh, thanks very much, Dave. I thought it was really, really amazing the experience you have, and thanks for sharing it. It's great to be here. Beautiful venue, too. Thanks, thank you. Dave. Take care.